It is privilege to introduce to, to today's speaker to you. This is, uh, yeah, Mrs. San Burgeshan is an uh, adjunct professor in the School of Computing at the Western Sydney University, the director of BRIT Professional Services and former editor in chief of the IEEE CS IT Professional Magazine. He is a distinguished lecturer of IEEE Computer Society and he has successfully led development of innovative IT projects, developed leadership in the research and development, conclaved and led several academic programs and offered consultancy services. Sir, it's a great privilege to have you with us, sir. I request you to now take, take over the session, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Hope you are able to hear me. Yes, yes sir, you're completely audible, sir. Okay. You can please go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first, welcome to this webinar. So it's my pleasure to be with you today and uh, speak about quantum computing. And before I do that, I would like to thank Dr. Jaffa and uh, Malibu Prasant and other uh, uh, members of the society for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so basically this will be a, a sort of a uh, introductory talk on quantum computing. There is a considerable talk or considerable popularity about quantum computing. So it is good to know about what the quantum computing is that, why there is so much of excitement from all circles. So today, my objective is to give a quick uh, glimpse of what quantum computing is and what its potentials are. So it is not intended to be a any detailed discussion on quantum computing. In the next uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, I will give you a quick overview of what quantum computing is and why it is important and why uh, there is a lot of interest, particularly from industry sectors on quantum computing. And uh, probably at the end, we can have a bit of a question and answer session. So that uh, I think that uh, would be uh, say concluding this session. So let me share my slides. Are you able to share my, see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it's completely visible, sir. You can please go. Okay. okay, so then let me continue. So uh, basically quantum computing, uh, many consider is a revolution. And revolution in the making, because it is not yet uh, sort of uh, uh, matured or not yet commercialized yet to the extent we would like to have. So that's why I titled as a revolution in the making. So still a lot more to be done that we will look at it. And before I discuss about the quantum computing, let us look at where we stand now in the landscape of computing. And particularly this year, assumes special significance in the history of computing. Uh, so it's a very really uh, special significance. What is the significance? Probably some of you are already aware of it, but nevertheless, just to keep in context, let me quickly highlight that. Basically, 2021 marks four significant anniversaries of important developments in computing and information technology. And when I say important, it's really important because they have given uh, uh, what you call foundation for further growth. And the growth and then advancement in those uh, the early foundations, that's what we are enjoying now. The number one, is the 75th anniversary of the first general purpose electronic digital computer. Because 75 years ago, the so-called general purpose digital electronic digital computer, basically though it was based on the vacuum tube, it will consider as the electronic digital computer was introduced to the public. So this is the 75th year of uh, celebration. And of course, as all of you know, it is also 75th anniversary of IEEE Computer Society. And the most importantly, it's also the 50th anniversary of microprocessor. Of course, you know that without the microprocessors, 
uh, we would not have reached the stage we are. So most of the contributions have been to the microelectronics and microprocessor. So this year we are celebrating the 15th anniversary of microprocessor. And also, uh, not many of uh, many people are aware, it's also 14th anniversary of a major foundation in computing. Uh, we'll look at that later, what that foundation is. So these are the major developments. But I assume, just to recap, the ENIAC is the first general purpose electronic computer. At uh, the, word, the name ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. That's uh, considered as a first general purpose electronic computer. But as some of you might recall, it was not intended for commercial use. Actually, it was a outcome of a project funded by the US Department of Defense. At that time, the purpose of that particular uh, say piece of work was to calculate ballistic trajectory dipoles for the defense purpose, because they were calculating manually using uh, differential analysis as well as other uh, small tools. But they wanted to have a better one, mainly to calculate the ballistic trajectory missile tables. And since it was a defense work, then it was remained a sort of a secret. It was done at the University of Pennsylvania through academic support. But then uh, on February 14th, 1946, the, the, then the uh, Department of uh, say Military, at that time it was called as War Department in the US, uh, decided to unveil the development of the ENIA computer to the public. So although the work was going on for, for the last, uh, before that for a few years, only on 14th of February, 1946, uh, public came to know about its development. And that date is considered as the uh, first general purpose electronic computer's uh, birth date or something. Of course, there are slightly different versions as well, but we will not go to get into that. So now we celebrate the 75th year of the first electronic digital computer. As you left C, you see that in the uh, photo, that's what the ENIAC computer at that time looked at it. It was based on the vacuum tube, so it occupied a full room size and so on and so forth. And the wiring programming was done by uh, wires taking out from one socket to the other socket like the old telephone exchange what we had in India. So that is one aspect. But the important thing is, uh, the art department, how they announced to the public was that they released a press release. What you see on the screen is a copy of the press release, photocopy of the press release. And you can see that on the top, it is given as a war department. At that time, it was called as a war department, not the military or uh, defense department, war department. But one uh, key thing in the, press, in the press release, even 75 years ago, they anticipated that that machine will revolutionize uh, the rest of the things. So I, I just read out of that particular sentence, a new machine that is expected to revolutionize the mathematics of engineering and change many of our industrial design methods was announced today by the War Department. Although it was intended for the defense purpose for the calculate the ballistic missile trajectory, but they envisage that it will have a major revolutionary impact on engineering, and which is truly so. So since at the beginning, after more or less at the similar time, uh, the, it was the foundation for the IEEE Computer Society was formed. Although at that time it was not called as IEEE Computer Society, uh, it has a different incarnations. We will not go into the details of that. But that's uh, 75 years ago, the major, uh, say, genesis of this society. And in order to celebrate the 75th uh, year of IEEE Computer Society, IEEE IT Professional Magazine, which is one of the magazines of the IEEE Computer Society, has come up with a special section. And uh, so that special section I happen to edit. And this is the screenshot of that particular section. So uh, I, the I, I continuing IT evolution revolution, uh, it was the May-June issue. So in addition to my guest editor's introduction, 
there are four other articles. In particular, I would like to bring to two articles to your attention. The one is 75 years of astonishing evolution of IT. That, but, uh, that article uh, so highlights uh, the various developments that has gone through over 75 years of it. And now, uh, over the 75 years, although the uh, computers have brought in a lot of benefits and revolutionized many things, digitally transformed almost everything, it also created other kind of problems. So that other article talks about the ethics of IT or how do we need to ethically align IT for the future purpose. So all the four articles together, they bring in uh, some sort of a, quite a glimpse of what has been happened and what is likely to happen. I'm happy to share the articles uh, with you. So well, I'll also make the slides available on my website and also I'll make it available with the uh, Java so you can uh, have access to that. And IEEE Computer Society, the computer magazine, as some of you might have noticed it, uh, plan to bring four articles. And one of the articles looks at the major computing developments over the past 75 years, and there are a few others as well. So that is about the uh, 75 year of uh, computing as well as the computing society. But if it has remained like that, we would not have reached the stage where we are now. But the major development took place after the emergence of microelectronics. Basically, the uh, multiple bipolar transistors were all integrated into a circuit in a base, silicon base. That is considered as a major development. And then following that, the world's first microprocessor came into existence, uh, the microprocessor 4004. Those who are old enough would have used this one at a very early stage. It was released to the public in 1971. And since then, things have changed a lot. And then we know all about that. And then Golden Moore, who was one of the architect of the Intel, as well as the earlier at Fairchild. So he came up with a, a prediction that the number of transistors in a chip will initially, uh, his uh, prediction was that initially doubled for every year. And then subsequently his corrected it, it will be approximately double for every 24 years. So that is later considered as a Moore's law. And for over 50 years, uh, basically it raised the bar for uh, the integrated circuits, silicon technology, as well as the microelectronic innovation. So that is considered as a golden rule. Uh, basically, it set the, it is, uh, set the goal, as well as meeting that goal has been a challenge. But fortunately, the architects of the microprocessor and the microelectronics experts, they made it possible to closely follow the Moore's law. And then the power of the microelectronics or microprocessors memories still kept on increasing. And I was fortunate to get the original article wherein Golden Moore wrote uh, what the likely projection for the future so it published in the electronics magazine. The electronic magazine was the popular magazines of that time. And then uh, you can see on the right side, a graph, which shows the number of transistors in a, in a chip. And then the dotted line was his prediction. So that eventually became the uh, sort of Moore's law. So now, we are reaching the stage wherein about 2.6 trillion transistors could be, uh, say, incorporated in a chip. So we have a scale integration and then it's good to nanometer scale level at the fabrication process and so on. And many of our of the view that we are nearing or we already reached the dead end and then it is not possible to in, uh, include many more transistors in a single chip. But on the other hand, there are also people who are working on some new innovations like uh, 3D architectures and then new innovations in the uh, microcomputer architecture and so on. They are of the view that still there is a room, space we can accommodate more things. 
So at least as of now, things have changed a lot from a few transistors or a few hundred transistors to 2.6 trillion transistors. And this development has revolutionized the whole world. We know that. So that is a, another major development. Right? And of course, I'll come to the, uh, what is the another major development and 40th anniversary of it a little later. So we all know that over a 45 or 50 years period, since the invention of the microelectronics, things have changed. And then almost we started from the mainframe computer, mini computer, parallel computer, supercomputer, and so on and so forth. And then ended up with personal computers and uh, say notebook computers and wearable computers and uh, much more power, powerful computers on your smartphone and so on, things like that. And obviously, there have been a major advances in the computer software as well, because hardware development alone is not good enough. They need to, we need to make use of the capabilities of the hardware, and then there have been development these computer software in terms of the programming languages, software development methodologies, testing approaches, and so on and so forth. All that resulted in a stage wherein we have a variety of computers in all forms and shapes, and also which can meet most of the needs. And then we can see the progress of that in almost every field. Now, the question is that, are the current computers good enough for solving all our computational problems? Because there have been tremendous advances in the computing information technology. And uh, so in all the areas related to them, there has been tremendous progress. We have applied in many areas. Uh, hardly it is uh, difficult to find any area there in the computer has not been applied. And the uh, advancement are still going on. So now who is that? Are we satisfied with what we have reached so far? Or in other words, are all current computers are good enough for solving problems? But most of us have to look that it's good enough because there are so much advances. We have even supercomputer on one side and then a handheld computer on our micro say smartphones and computers have entered in almost every object, if you want to say that, with the Internet of Things and things like that. But if you look closely, you will discover that the current computers are not good enough for solving some kind of problems. My emphasis is not good enough for solving some kind of problems. Then what is the solution? So as the slide up indicates, despite immense progress in computing power and usage, there are several pressing, pressing computational problems that even the most powerful computers cannot solve. So that is the reality. So what are those kind of problems? They are not tiny problems. There are major problems of importance, such as molecular simulation, weather forecasting, and in terms of the security, integer factorization, cryptography, and the development of new drugs, and a new kind of simulation that is needed for, uh, say, making a new fertilizer, and things of that sort. So there are many critical areas wherein even the current supercomputers are not good enough to address the problem within a reasonable amount of time. So even the most advanced computer, supercomputers require, require several years to solve some of these problems. That is the reality. It is not just a, a sort of a guess or perspective, it is a reality. So in some cases, they have proven that to compute the financial risk that a bank takes in under certain conditions. If you want to compute it, taking account all the factors, then it might take more than 10 years. So that is even using the super fast computer. So despite the development on one side, on the other side, we do have uh, situations wherein the current uh, supercomputers cannot solve some of the problems of importance. So that is the current status. So the thing is that how can we address these problems? We want to make further progress. 
and there are several problems in the society that need to be addressed too. For some of which we need a, a new year solution, computerized solution or computer-based solution. Then the question is that, is there a viable solution to address this problem? And if there is a viable solution, what is it? And on the one side, we are uh, reaching the uh, sort of a stalemate or the limits of, uh, say, the integrated circuit. We can't uh, pack in many more, uh, say, chips, or it is hard to improve further drastically orders of magnitude the speed of the computation. So if that is the case, do we need a new computing paradigm? One interesting thing to note is that over the last 75 years, the computing paradigm, the traditional computing paradigm, more or less remained the same. There has not been a major revolutionary change in that. Most of the revolution took place in packing more and more transistors in a single chip. And that led to a lot of uh, say, progress. But nevertheless, over 75 years, the computing basic computing paradigm they remain the same. There has been no change. And but if you want to make further progress, then do we need a new computing paradigm? That is the question that has been uh, in the mind of uh, many people. And then they have come up with a solution. What is that solution? That is the quantum computing. A totally a new and radical computing paradigm that can address the problem that we just discussed because that has the power, computing power, many hours of magnitude than even the supercomputer. So the, the sort of suggestion is that, yes, we do need a radical computing paradigm. And that radical computing paradigm would be the quantum computing. Although the various other uh, radical computing paradigm has been suggested like molecular computing and other such things, nature inspired computing, so on. The quantum computing is the, has the most potential. So if uh, such a radical computing paradigm, what is it? So the quantum computing is just not as faster and more powerful version of traditional computers. That's what the progress has been. We made it move faster and faster and more powerful version of the uh, computers over the last, say, 40, 50 years. But the quantum computing is not that. If you want to take an uh, analogy, take the analogy of a candle before the inversion of electronic bulb and the inversion of electronic bulb. Although both give light, they are entirely different principles. Different principles, different operating mechanisms, different outcome though they both give the light. In a similar way, the traditional computing and quantum computing is vastly different in its operation, in its capabilities. It operates in a totally different way. Hence, it is a radically different computing paradigm because the quantum computing is based on the principle of quantum mechanics. So we are talking about the quantum physics, quantum mechanics at the subatomic particle level. So it is entirely different principle of operation. It is not just a gradual or an extension of the existing paradigm or adverse of the existing one. So the result is that we have orders of magnitude faster uh, so computing paradigm that can solve some of the problems that I highlighted earlier. So just to give you an example, Uh, the Deutsche Bank in Germany, they did a pilot application. So they wanted to look at uh, the risk factor, risk calculation. So they say, found that the quantum computing can solve a problem that would have taken a traditional computer about 10 years time to about 30 minutes. This is just to show that uh, how uh, fast or how capable a quantum computing could be compared to a traditional, even super fast computer. So I've given the reference. I will make the slides available so those who are interested can look at it. 
So it's it just to give you an idea about the uh, tremendous improvement that we are look, looking at. So with that uh, brief intro, let us look at the, what quantum computing is and how does we get such a uh, enormous computing power. So as I said earlier, the quantum computing is a form of computing based on the principle of quantum mechanics. So, uh, so it is good to get some basics of the quantum mechanics to understand the quantum computing. So what principles or mechanism of quantum mechanics is used in quantum computing is the following two. The, there are others as well, I will highlight it soon, but the most uh, say prominent is the two of the properties of quantum mechanics, which is known as one is the superposition, other is entanglement. I will uh, soon uh, highlight it what we mean by superposition, what is an entanglement. So in the quantum, in the traditional computing, we call it a bit. So each binary bit, we know that it can be in only in one of the two states, either zero or one. And then the transistors accept is the basic element. And then it is, can be in one of these states, zero or one. And then that's used for the traditional computer. But whereas in the quantum computer, we call it as a quantum bits, which is abbreviated as qubits. Qubits basically correspond to a bit in a traditional computer. So here in this case, it's called quantum bits abbreviated as qubits. The beauty of the qubit is that, or the quantum bit, it is not just to only two states, either zeros or one. In, in principle, it can be in any state, any, uh, any of the states, many states, a combination of zero or one. It can be simultaneously, it could be zero, and simultaneously it can be one as well. That's where the uh, superposition comes into picture. Basically, the qubit has infinite possibilities, infinite states, because if you take it, it can be in either zero or one at a different, uh, say, probabilities of this one, then you get a infinite possibilities. That's where you get the power. So the qubit is the main uh, computing element of a quantum computer. And it can be in uh, many states, both in the uh, zero or one simultaneously at the same time. And then when do you make a measurement, then it comes to one of the states, either are zero or one. So when you say that it can be in, uh, uh, say, multi uh, many states, it can be in any one of the multiple stages, then when you take a measurement, it comes to either falls down to zero or one. That is the basics of the qubit. Okay, so then the question is uh, why there is a lot of interest about the quantum computing and why we need to learn about quantum computing. And as I said, there are uh, many uh, uh, major problems that could not yet be fully resolved by traditional computer. So if we, there is a possibility or even there is a potential promise of a quantum computing, then everybody want to know about it, everybody want to make use of it, there is a greater interest both in academia as well as in industry, as well as the government as well, because the type of the problems that uh, quantum computing has potential to address has large implications. So the many nations are interested in industry is interested, academic and researchers interested in, there is a growing interest because of the expected potential. And many believe that uh, it will make a major transformation, more like a, what the electricity, electricity did or the steam engine did, and more recently, internet and Wi-Fi has done it. And uh, particularly in the last four or five years, there is an increased interest. And uh, the expectation is that there will be further progress in computing, quantum computing and uh, its applications. And hence, it is an imperative that not only the academic and professional, as well as the young students, aspiring professionals, need to be stay ahead of the curve and then they want to learn about the quantum computing. So that's how the interest piles up. 
then uh, if you think of quantum computing, it is, or even, even quantum mechanics, it is not an easy subject to understand. That we need to acknowledge that. Even the expert in uh, quantum computing, Richard Feynman, said that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Meaning to say that it is fairly complicated and uh, we, we may think that we understand, but not really fully understand. That's what it means. If you think you understand the quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. That shows that how complex that quantum mechanics phenomena to understand this. But nevertheless, but when you look at the application level, applied level, things are different or frankly easier. So uh, in the next uh, say half an hour or so, I will just look at it, what is uh, quantum computing is, but I gave you a brief idea, but let me explore further into that and how does it work and who are the major players and uh, for example, if you want to get into using quantum computer, how you can do that and then how it might impact the future. Just to give you a brief overview. I said that the quantum computing looks from many different perspectives. You can look at from the quantum mechanics perspective, look at the internal working. You can uh, look at from an IT or computing professional's perspective, just look at the, not the inner, so much inner uh, functioning, but more as an application point of view. Or even from a mathematical point of view, you can analyze it the quantum computing. So there are many views uh, of uh, looking at quantum computing. But what we look at it from an application point of view, we look at it without going too much technical detail into the quantum computing or the mathematical aspect of it. For those who are interested in, uh, there are a lot of resources. Some of the resources I will highlight it as well. Uh, this, uh, we all know about it. Uh, so first generation, second generation, third generation computers, starting with vacuum tube, transistor, integrated circuit, microprocessors. So the fourth generation uh, so made a major progress. That's where we stand. And the next stage is probably the quantum computers. So that we can, some can say fifth generation computer. So we know all about the uh, say classic computers, basically, uh, we use a bit of zero or one, and then we use the uh, logic gates, uh, like and or not and all that. But nowadays, no one uh, design anything with the discrete logic gates. We make use of the microcomputers. And then here is a brief description about the quantum, which I explained earlier as well. The quantum bit, or it's a simultaneous, it is both in one and zero state. And uh, that's where we have the quantum bits or qubits allow multiple or parallel computations occur simultaneously. The quantum mechanics or the quantum computers operate at the nano scale. And this particular slide so it explains about what we mean by the quantum uh, bit in a, in a traditional one, either it can be zero or one, whereas in a qubit, quantum bit, it can be partly one and partly zero, that is called the superposition principle. And then when you measure it, then it falls into either of the states. Either it could be zero or one. There is a probability it could be 70, 30, or 80, 20. That's it. And this is what it gives rise to the infinite power or the increased capabilities of the quantum computer. And then uh, this particular slide, uh, talks about various uh, activities that happens in a quantum computer. So the first one is, that's what uh, we just discussed. So basically the core qubit can be either zero or one, both simultaneously together. That's a superposition principle. So what you see here is a superposition that is uh, say block two. A qubit can be in uh, say either zero or one, or as well as on multiple combinations of zero and one and so on. That is one property that quantum computer makes use of. The another important property that the quantum computer makes use is what is called as an entanglement. For those who are familiar with quantum mechanics, 
uh, uh, can recall that what they mean by entanglement. In a traditional computer, so we, suppose let us have a 16-bit computer. So one bit, uh, one bit doesn't affect the other. Whereas in a quantum computer, one bit can influence the neighboring bit. That's the entanglement. One affects the other. That's why it's called as entanglement. So as I read it out, contrary to bits whose value we try to keep well separated, where in the quantum bit, the one affects the other as well. So that means that one influences the other, no matter even if they're slightly different or apart. That is another property that it makes use of it. And that gives rise to a large number of possibilities. One is that each by itself can be in a sort of many positions. And one affects the others as well. That is the entanglement property. And then like in a general gates, you have the quantum gates, very different, a few different kinds of quantum gates. And finally, you make a measurement and finally you into either zero or one. The key are superposition, entanglement, and then different form of combining the gates and then the bionic So this is the general principle of operation of a quantum computer. So with that, so this is then, uh, this one particular one uh, slide summarizes that. And how do you represent a qubit? So we use what is called as a kit notation. KET, KET notation, KET0 and KET1. So it is represented, zero. this is called as a KET0, like a vertical bar, zero and then arrow, and then here. And then this is what we use in a mathematical notation, like we use a B1, B2 in a traditional binary. This we use KET notation in the quantum computer. So that is uh, just for the principle. And then, uh, there are, again, different types of quantum computing uh, people have initiated. And they are, there are three primary types, and each is, has its own complexities and then the process. And as you see here in the graph, on the horizontal, it's a time to commercialization or the easiness. On the vertical side is the processing power and the application capabilities. One is called the quantum annealing. Uh, that is easier to, relatively easier to implement and then relatively lesser capabilities and then quantum simulation and the quantum, universal quantum, that is a, uh, a larger goal if you want to call it. But it's uh, difficult it, by time to commercialize it will be longer, but the capabilities also higher. So depending upon the type of the application, one can use the either one of the quantum type. And the next slide side, few slides, I'll just quickly go through what each one of the one of them are and then look at the application. This is a quantum annealing or a quantum annealer. Uh, basically the difficulty level is uh, relatively less. That's what the two dot uh, bright blots uh, indicate. And mainly it's used to address the optimization problems. And uh, it's not a universal like the other one. So it is primarily meant for addressing the optimization problems. And uh, so the power also is less, but at the same time, it's also easy to implement. And the other is, uh, which comes at the intermediate category. It is of uh, medium difficulty. When I say medium, it's relative within among them. And it's called as analog quantum. Uh, its application areas are quantum chemistry, chemistry, material science, and also the higher levels of optimization problems, sampling, and so on and so forth. And this is the middle level. And then the universal quantum has a much more really difficulty level. That's the expectation. So it can also go ahead a uh, 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 wider range of the problem. The computational power is high, just to distinguish between the three different types. And then, uh, as I said, there are a lot of players in the quantum computing arena. And uh, some of them are really major players in the IT domain. 
and uh, they are trying different technologies so it is not at matured yet so many industry players are different trying different approaches or different technologies on the left side in the table i have given the type of the technology on the right side of the table or the column 2 i given the who are the players who are looking at it so if you see there the players almost all the major players are in this domain ibm google microsoft amazon and uh, say others and also these relatively new players like d wave so they are trying different things so in the future probably we may not be using all the different technologies we may be using few some will mature and then we will follow them so there are different technologies we tried by different people and probably in the future we may zero on their two or three of those technologies this so that is as far as the uh, hardware is concerned and there has been a lot of progress in the years uh, by major players in this area yes and then uh, once you have the quantum farm hardware that's not alone good enough you also need a software to use it otherwise it is having a more powerful computer but if you don't have a software to make use of it is of no use the same argument applicable is here as well so the there's where the quantum algorithms like a traditional computer algorithm you have a quantum algorithm and then two of the popular algorithms are shor's algorithm and grover's algorithm of course there are other interesting algorithms also are being developed or have already emerged in the recent past so those are the quantum software or quantum algorithms too so here as someone said the real race is not just only the quantum hardware which people are try but also quantum software as well because hardware alone it won't be of much use unless we also develop the appropriate software for that so the real race is that between those two not between the traditional computer and the quantum computer meaning that we also need to develop an appropriate software that makes it of the capabilities of the quantum computer but the quantum computer as you probably would have heard and then could realize it not something which every organization or every academic institution could have it it's very very complex quite expensive and then the question arises is how you and me can get an access to the quantum computer how we can make use of it so not necessarily so it is not going to sit any time uh, on your desktop or in your desktop or not even within your organization so only the larger organizations will have it so if the quantum computing capabilities we need to make use of it what is the option what access there that's where the quantum computing as a service comes into picture you don't want the quantum computer but you can have access to that you can make use of it so that is the exactly the same principle as the tau popular cloud computing is said so basically using the cloud computing uh, say infrastructure as a front end you can access the quantum computing and then pay for what you use it that's the quantum computing as a service almost all the quantum uh, say cloud computing providers now offer some form of uh, access to back end quantum computing ibm amazon google microsoft and almost everyone offers that for the developers that is the approach it so you make use of it quantum computing as a service even now you can uh, say get into that and then start using or trialing some of them that's where the quantum computing as a service comes into picture and the quantum computing developers also they come up with several tools and i just highlighted three of them only ibm and what is called as a quirk and dlo so this is what the developers currently make use of it to develop uh, say software or trial various applications so this is on the development side 
And uh, the student will want to look at it, where we apply this such a large computational power, what kind of problems that are most suited for, then I highlighted, uh, just uh, mentioned few of them. Then we now come up with a certain kind of a terminology called quantum advantage computation problems. Quantum advantage computation problems. What does it mean is that the problems that are better suited to be solved by a quantum computers. That's what we mean by quantum advantage computation problems. There are kind of pro several problems in many different areas. Uh, that's what I'll just highlight now to get an appreciation of where the quantum computing could be applied. If you look at the type of the problems, forget about the where it can be applied, but if you look at the type of the problems that are better, quicker, can be better solved by quantum computer, and then uh, on the left side, left hand column, on the type of a problem, one is the optimization problems. Although we are using traditional computers for optimization now, but their capabilities are limited or we are making optimization based on some simplification. But if you want to take all the parameters into account, all the complexities and then uncertainties into account, it becomes a, too hard for a computer, traditional computer. So the one kind of problems that is uh, could be better solved by quantum computers, the combination combinatorial optimization problems or optimization problems. And other thing is that uh, in the fluid dynamics, you come differential equations, solving differential equations to predict the flow and other things. And also the other is the linear algebra and factorization and then security. These are the four different type of class of problems. But where do you, where it's going to be useful for and then how, where the industry applications are there for each one of them I have given here. And the same thing I will highlight it in the subsequent slides. So uh, you might be, I, if you are wondering. Uh, hello? Hello, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Madhu here. Uh, this is Madhu. Uh, I'm a vice chair for um, IEEE CSC chapter uh, on behalf of uh, uh, chapter. So um, we are left with uh, 10 more minutes, sir. And uh, would you mind uh, sharing some space as well for the Q&A session? Because I mean, uh, we might expect some questions as well. Yes. Uh, and, I'm and almost so, uh, towards the end. Uh, I'll okay. take another couple of minutes and then we'll leave it uh, rest of the time for the question and answer. And and also please share the presentation uh, which you have, uh, when, if that is possible thing, to the subjected email addresses so that we can all see that as well. Yes. I will add that. So basically, there are many areas. Uh, the main area people are targeting is the drug development. In order to develop a new drug, it takes years and years. And uh, that is uh, one area, financial modeling and risk calculation, the better batteries. Already now, many people showing interest uh, in using quantum computing to come up with uh, better batteries and the fertilizer, new development of a new fertilizer also takes a lot of time because the molecule simulation takes more time and traffic optimization, weather forecasting and uh, the material, new material discovery. Uh, these are some of the areas. So as I mentioned there, so there are many areas. So what we are looking at it, how we can make use of them for uh, coming up with uh, new chemicals, new fertilizers, and optimization problems and supply chain management. And those are the things that they the potential are there. So these are the slides, I'll just I leave it. I, and also healthcare also is a other area because people are now talking about personalized medicine and so on and so forth. And agriculture, where is the, the sort of a custom made fertilizer and uh, those are the where the lot of simulation comes into picture is a potential area. And then in the AI, uh, so uh, there are people are talking about the quantum AI, meaning that application of quantum computing in machine learning and other areas in a much advanced one. And then when the, I have to mention one thing, when we talk about the quantum computing, 
people are tracking that uh, what is the risk to the traditional computing. So if uh, we have so much of power on the quantum computer, now the current uh, say security mechanisms are based on the uh, assumption or the fact that you can't uh, say uh, hack, hack meaning that the encryption code, but if the uh, say quantum computers become so powerful, then is it, uh, will it be a possibility that say you know, some of the existing uh, say security mechanisms will fail? Yes, it's possible, but it's not any time in the short time. And also people are looking at a new way of yes, improving the security of computing, and uh, that is called as a post-quantum security. So those are some of the things. And uh, since uh, the potential of the quantum and almost many industries are interested in, and also the government are interested in, the almost uh, major uh, national governments are coming up with the quantum, strat quantum computing strategies like US, China, UK, Australia. And also, as uh, you may recall that even the government of India has uh, earmarked, or it's the announcer, they are earmarking a good amount of money for quantum computing technology development. So there is increasing interest. But nevertheless, there are also failures. We are at the initial stage where quantum system is fragile, and then we need a more stable platform, and the number of qubits also need to be increased, and uh, there is a commercial platform for software development is needed. So there are many challenges, but the expectation is that over a period of time, and then maybe next five years, 10 years time, we will make the challenges uh, will be addressed in some way, and then there's a greater prospects for quantum computing. So with that, uh, so the prospects are look bright, and potentials are so large, and hence there is the interest is there. So everyone, there is a lot of hype, but at the same time, it is not just a clear, uh, idealistic hype. There is yeah, some promise for it. So that's why there is a lot of interest in it. I'll just want to just show you the two uh, sort of uh, slides. How is your quantum computer prototype is coming? They just say that uh, both simultaneously on and off. So just to reflect the point of this. I'll just leave it. And then there are a lot of resources I will make it available to you. And also there are some articles I have been involved with and I also make it available to you. So I mentioned that actually this year is the 40th anniversary of the basic announcement of quantum computing. I said that I'll talk it later. So basically it's a quantum computing in some way uh, it is uh, celebrating its 40th anniversary because 40 years ago was the initial idea that quantum mechanics principles could be used for computing. That was the idea was uh, discussed in a uh, conference held at MIT. Although there has not much happened after that, only in the last, say, five to 10 years, there has been major development. So that's what I would like to share with you within the time available. So I have shared my, uh, say, web link, www.tinyurl.com, stroke Simon Bio. So I will make it that uh, my slides available there under my recent seminars, and then you can download it tomorrow. So um, I will hand over the platform to the organizers so that we can take up the questions if any. Sure, sir. Uh, our pleasure. Uh, having said that, uh, the quantum computing, I see a lot of news uh, and trends which are going on the quantum computing on the research and the developments going on by IBM and Google especially. So I have one question for you, sir. So I hardly see any kind of an um, other discussions apart from the distinguished lectures or the, some of the R&D people. So where can we kind of an core resource to learn deep into quantum computing? Or is there any kind of an universities which offer uh, the masters? Or is it too early to talk about that right now? No, it is not too early. Uh, uh, already the people offer, started offering courses, not the course, at least subjects on quantum computing. And uh, mm -hmm. there are already books on quantum computing, which you can look at it. 
And then it, de it depends upon how deep you want to go it, at what level you want to go it. So you want to go at the physics level or you want to look at from a computer professional level, there are a lot of resources available. But at the same time, it is an emerging field. It's not at, uh, say, fully matured enough. It is uh, emerging. But a lot of resources are available to learn about it. And uh, the, some of the things what I mentioned is helpful. And also, there are uh, free uh, online uh, courses available on quantum computing as well. And it has been recorded. You can uh, go through them. And Got it. Though and, the uh, field is fluid, but at the same time, because of the increasing interest, there are a lot of resources available. I don't think that uh, there is a limitation on the resources. Okay. Got it, sir. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, we have one more question from uh, Professor Atul Nagi Garu. How many quid bits will, will it take to do some threshold level practice applica uh, practical applications? I think that uh, about 1,000 and above. Okay. Okay, let me... Uh, um, uh, okay. So that was his question, actually. It's 1,000 and above. I mean, how, uh, what would be the calculation matrix of this, sir, when we know that? Uh, could you repeat again? So how do we calculate it generally? So what are the metrics which we calculate on the quid bits? No, I don't know what you mean by metrics. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. if you expect that uh, if we not do a full-scale computation, then you need a okay. large number of qubits. And we are not yet reached the stage yet to reaching the multi. So now we are only in the few hundred stage. Okay, okay. Got it, sir. Got it. And uh, any other questions from the team on the participants which you have? Would be happy to spare a couple of more minutes on this. You can unmute yourself and happy to speak or else you can type in the QA session as well. We'll wait for a couple of minutes, sir. And nice. then, uh, I'm available. <laughs> thanks for that. Requesting all the attendees, if you have any kind of question, either you can type it out or else uh, unmute yourself to directly, uh, you can have a direct talk uh, with Murugeshan, sir. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Professor Balasubhamidian, Vice Chair of the Section. Hello, yes. uh, Professor Murugesan? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Very well. Yes, I am very well. Please yes, go ahead. Hello. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Uh huh. Uh, th thanks, Professor Murugesan, for, uh, for uh, no, giving an overall exposure of this very evolving uh, topic. Hello? Yes. Are you able Please to hear me? Ahead. Yes. Balsamon Mangu, sir, we are able to hear you. Your, uh, your voice was clear enough. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Hope you're able to hear us. Uh, thanks for you know, giving you know the uh, information about this evolving topic, but it seems to be you know uh, very much in the beginning stage as uh, as we can understand. Of course, I am not a computing person. I am in the uh, you know power systems and electrical engineering branch. Um, so you were saying one of the potential applications is the optimization methods. Yes. Uh, so uh, we do a lot of optimization. Um, in that, basically, you know, uh, like you are talking about some probabilities and you know those things also coming into picture. Uh, in addition to the binary variables, uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in fact, one thing which strikes me is the, uh, you know, the say the new type of evolutionary programming, genetic algorithms, those things, you know, we use in the optimization quite a bit. Those are the intelligent methods yes, of optimization. Um, so when you are talking about a potential application as optimization, then I was wondering, you know, um, see, has, is there any you know, connection uh, between these things? Do you take some samples and, th and then, you know, you do uh, some, uh, um, uh, you, you have some clustering kind of thing and then, you know, you have various levels and then you go to the, see, local optimization, uh, local minimization and then the uh, global minimization, those things come into picture uh, in those things and then, you know, uh, so those methods are very good. Uh, you know, so is there any you know similarities between these things? You know, in the quantum no, there are similarities and though, uh, uh, regular computing. Uh, yes, though the yeah, optimization yeah, part, they are doing it in many different areas. What? Uh, so I am not an expert in optimization, but what they are people are looking at it at a global level. Suppose if you take a smart city. And then you want for the no. say for a Delhi, you want to optimize the traffic. So we are mm -hmm. as I rightly said, you may be optimizing at the local level. If you want to optimize at the global level, and then right. say for example, uh, what happened into the uh, say recent uh, uh, shipment problem, cargo ship got stuck up, mm -hmm. and then it completely changed the supply chain. Then how do you uh, address those kind of problems and that sort of thing? So when I say optimization problems, there are kind of optimization problems that are difficult to be handled by currently. So that's what people are looking at it. And similarly, we have been doing molecular simulations, but mm -hmm. to what level and how long does it take? So if it takes for the new drug discovery three years, but have, it is too long. Yeah, How can yeah, we yeah. reduce it and what can be done? That's kind of problem they are looking at it. So it doesn't mean that the current way of optimization for local optimization will go away. The traditional computers will be there. We will be using the traditional computer. For certain kind of problems, then we need a different type of computing and that kind of computing could be the quantum computing. Uh, maybe it is a combination. See, as I was telling you about this, uh, Evolutionary programming and you know those it's, things. It's a combination. Uh, similar, uh, the techniques could be you know kind of similar, and then you know it could be done. And uh, I think you know it will be very useful if we give some small applications at least you know in 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 the future, uh, you know webinars or uh, you know say lectures, if we can give some small uh, you know even smaller problems. Uh, and yes, give some details, that. then that will be very useful for many of our students and our research scholars and all that. Thank you yes. very much. It was a very interesting, you know, lecture by you. And we got a lot of, you know, uh, information about, yes. you know, this evolving, you know, um, yes, it is evolving uh, one. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, both uh, the hardware of, uh, and software. Is there. It, it and, looks quite, you uh, know, attractive. A lot of resources yeah. as well. It may yeah. give further information to yeah. if someone yeah. wants to take it further, yeah. satisfy yeah. that that will help. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Mr. Madhu. Huh? Madhu, any other question? Yeah. My pleasure, sir. I don't see any other question which has been popped up uh, uh, in the window. I, okay, there was uh, one question, I believe. How many so how many defense algorithms so uh, has been there in the quantum is the one which I have seen. How many applications in defense where the quantum has been implemented is the one which I have seen it, but uh, somehow again I was unable to see that in my window. No, they have, I just mentioned the two, the shores algorithm, the another one, but there are uh, many other uh, emerging algorithms as well. And then uh, people are also looking at it. Now, as I say, it's an emerging field. Now, people are also looking at that, how we can better make use of the capabilities of the quantum computer. So that is the one, as I mentioned earlier, 
that is one area that will be lacking even though if your computer hardware development takes faster the software development how we are going to make use of that will be another question I mean, and the reason for me to ask is that I am actually keen in terms of getting a lot of information in quantum because I see a future on that. Yes, there is a oh, lot of future. <laughs> That's why everyone is trying as well. <laughs> no, just uh, uh, start uh, learning about it. So, no, okay. Also, uh, in my, in my uh, say resource set, I will uh, provide some information, and then it's, mm-hmm. so you can go at uh, any level of depth you want to. Oh yeah. It will be grateful, sir. And I think uh, we are about 10 minutes. We started a bit uh, late, but still, I think we have covered a half a plus of time. Um, so thank you very much, sir. Um, it's been a pleasure to see, your, uh, see you. And I believe it's late night for you already. And yes, uh, you took all the time for us. It's not so easy for someone. Uh, I, I mean, I believe it's like around at, uh, 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. right now. No, no, no. 10 o'clock. Not that, uh, because we are four and a half hours ago, so that's uh, like just close up to ten. Still a good time to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was a pleasure to have you, sir, and uh, definitely um, we'd like to have one more session in depth of the level of quantums. Maybe if you can share a kind of, and I will be definitely going to your presentation for sure. And maybe after that, we'll try to come up with a series of questions. Maybe at the time, we'd like to have one more session. Okay, and as I said. Sir. Uh, it's like around a bit early for most of them. Uh, that includes me and that includes the senior professionals and the professors are here. Not so easy for someone to get grasped with quantum yet, but I strongly believe that this is the only time to get it. No, it's right. Yeah. As I said, it's a, even for others, it's a, a hard topic. Oh, okay. The field itself is like that. And uh, you can look at it from a many different angles. Oh, okay. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. And my pleasure, sir. My, it's not my pleasure. Uh, to be frank, uh, it's I triple pleasure to have you on the board. And I uh, wish we'll have a, more sessions with you. And um, we really thank you for coming up or here in the uh, odd timings of you. And next time, we'll try to get with the time where you can get a best sleep. <laughs> so that we'll no, try to okay. get uh, 12 p.m. at the time, our time, so that, that would be a great, uh, good time for you. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Any other okay, people? Thank you, it's my pleasure people? as well. Thanks for participation, for listening. And yeah. thank you. My pleasure, sir. Thank you, and uh, signing off, team. Uh, meanwhile, uh, for next 20 seconds, if someone would like to um, convey something, yes, the window is open for everyone. <laughs> Okay, then uh, from everyone behalf, uh, it's my pleasure to have you, sir. Okay, thank you. Nice of you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, team. Thank you for your for participation. And thank you, Balso Pramanyangaru, uh, Jabba, sir, Sai, and other people. Okay, see you. Bye. Off. Uh, we are closing this window. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.